Well, we are in session 20 of the book of Genesis. We expect to finish it in 24 sessions. And uh, this session closes the uh, session on Jacob. We've, we've, you notice the big shift of gears when we got after chapter 11. The first 11 chapters being what some people call unit 1. It's a, what some people call prehistory. But from chapter 12, the call of Abraham, right on through are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, uh, and so you, you notice a change of style, if you will. It's become very much a narrative. Uh, here and there are some things that are hidden behind rocks, perhaps. But in general, it's very straightforward. You can just read it and understand it, um, with, requiring very relatively little ampl amplification. And we're going to move from here to a third shifting of gears, if you will, when we get to the, the narrative of Joseph, which is, has to be one of the most phenomenal, touching dramas in the scriptures. But we are, we've, we've been through the uh, first uh, 14 sessions. We've actually budgeted ourselves. We allowed ourselves um, uh, uh, 14 sessions to cover the first 11 chapters because we really focused on the foundation, the creation. But uh, we are, at this point, in the second of two sessions on Jacob. When we finish this, we'll be shifting to three sessions on Joseph, this colorful figure that is forthcoming. And uh, we're going to talk about J Jacob's wrestling. One of the strangest passages in the Bible is this business of Jacob spending all night wrestling with someone. And that will raise more questions than we have answers. Um, very, very strange thing. And then we, he, of course, is preparing to reconcile with his... The, the, his uh, older brother that he defrauded, and uh, he's very apprehensive of that, about that for good reason. Then there's this strange event that occurs with Dinah, and uh, we'll talk about that, of course, when we get there, and then, then he returns to Bethel. And then there's one final chapter before we get into Joseph, where we just uh, deal with uh, his, uh, the, the generations of Esau, his older brother that's an adversary, if you will of uh, Jacob's in, 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 uh, many gen for many generations. Genesis chapter 32, verse 1. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. Simple phrase, but sure raises some issues. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahananaim. And uh, which means two camps, or second, yeah, two camps is really the way it's generally translated. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. The land of Seir is a synonym for the land of Edom. They both mean the, pretty much the same thing. And, of course, that's the land of Esau, it'll turn out. But this, uh, the name of this place called Menaim, and uh, it's, um, you may recall that this same thing took place um, when he was um, on his way back to the land from, uh, well, we'll get into it. The angels of, the, the, the two camps. There are two passages. We saw the passage in chapter 28 when he encountered these angels the first time in this, in this place. And then uh, we find it here in this chapter. There's a term that appears, the angels of God, in, in its particular form, occurs only twice in the Old Testament in, it, in regards to these two places. There's also a phrase in the Hebrew that's used four times in chapter uh, 28, and uh, we find it used not only there but also in this chapter uh, the, uh, where it says, this is the gate of heaven or this is the camp of God. There's a Hebrew construction that is similar in both. In both of these cases, in chapter 28 and in chapter 32, Jacob interprets what he had seen before he names it, and the identical expression is used in the naming of both places. And that really is why I suspect it's called two camps. There are several other reasons why you may see this as two camps, and we'll talk about that. But I think one of the fundamental aspects behind that naming is that it happened twice. Once on his way to, you know, there, or to Haran, and once on his way back. And so there's also a, uh, a phrase, the halakandera, to go one's way or to take a journey, are used in both places. So there's some Hebrew constructions. It's clear from the Hebrew text especially that these two passages in chapter 28 that we saw before and the one we're encountering here are intended to be seen together. And so uh, anyway, uh, and what Jacob does after seeing this, he sends messengers to Esau. Now, the word messenger and angel are equivalent. 
So these are God's messengers that he saw, and one infer he either he inferred or they, he was instructed to send messages. And he's, he is obviously very apprehensive about his in, uh, intended encounter with Esau. And uh, so, and he, com he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. You're we're talking 20 years here. You get the picture. And I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Now you may recall he staged all these things in groups. And as these groups, as Esau encounters these groups, before he encounters, he's, he's going to find one after the other, he's going to get softer because they're gifts, you see. And, we'll, and, and this is, Jacob is expecting him to seek his life. That was his final, his, his older brother, when he was defrauded back 20 years ago, he vowed he was going to get, get him. So the, now these years have gone by, and so Jacob's encountering him, and he's needle, understandably very uh, uh, apprehensive. And uh, so... Now, <laughs> the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and by the way, <laughs> and 400 men with him. You know, that's a bunch of men. <laughs> you know, you don't bring those along just to party. <laughs> then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, understandably. And he divided the people that was with him, and the flocks and the herds and the camels, into two bands, or two groups, okay? The... Menahnoi, it's a, uh, two camps. It's a, it, that's again, seems to echo the name of the place that he gave because of the angels. But there may be far more going on here. Uh, it may be just that Jacob was developing his strategy following that model. Or he may even been instructed that the text doesn't give us that any basis to believe that. But in any case, he, he divided them um, uh, in, uh, uh, into two bands or groups and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So see, part of this is a defensive strategy. It's a defense in depth, in a sense, okay? And Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham. Now, he goes into a, a prayer, um, and his deep fear shows up in his prayer. Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which says unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. He's going to go on, but let's just take up a couple of things. You notice how he starts. He reminds God of God's commitment to him. This is the God which said unto me, return to the country, and so forth. He's, he, in other words, he's reminding God of God's commitment to him, first of all. And the second thing he does, um, I'm not worthy of the least of all thy mercies. Boy, we really need to say that and mean it when we pray. You know, uh, no matter how far down we are, no matter how, what kind of problems we have, uh, we're not getting what we deserve. The last thing in the world we ever want is justice. We want that which we, you know, that's the difference between grace and mercy. Grace is getting that which you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, we need to, one of the, 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 the important things you will gain as you get closer to your Bible and get deeper in the scripture is to really understand this incredible gulf between us uh, sinful men and women and the, the holiness of God. But here Jacob, with all his blessings and all his proximity and all these things, he says, I am not worthy of the least of all thy mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan and have become two bands. Then he goes to his petition. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau. For I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. There's his candor. He puts it out there doesn't pussyfoot around. That's what he's sweating. We should be just as candid and open with God. I remember, this, I was so touchy when I see Hezekiah, the days of Isaiah, when he took this, this challenge from the Babylonians, and he unrolled it before the altar. Let the Lord see what he's facing. You know, he didn't just tell him about it. There it is, you know, and uh, so on. So, if you have a piece of property you're praying over, 
put the legal description on the altar and talk to the Lord about it or whatever, whatever it might be that you're dealing with them on. Be, be very direct with them. And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good. See, he reminds God again when he said, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. One of the things um, to uh, all this, this prayer should, of course, have built Jacob's confidence as he, in effect, by praying this, reminds himself that God made these commitments. God is listening. He is a God that, he is a God that delights in answering prayer. But one of the other things to be sensitive to, often God will use your prayers as his way of enlisting you in what he's trying to do. And clearly one of the things here, you know, this, 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 this meeting with Esau is foreordained. And so uh, Esau, uh, the, uh, Jacob needs to handle it properly. Anyway, go, uh, the, verse 13, he lodged there that same night and took of that which came into his hand a present for Esau his brother. And here's his present for Esau. You ready for this? 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 uh, kine and 10 bulls, 20 she-asses, 10 foals. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and, uh, drove, and drove. He wants them, you know, he doesn't want them all there at once. One after another in sequence, okay? And uh, he commanded the foremost, saying, When he saw my brother meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou? Whither goest thou? And whose are these before thee? Thou sh then thou shalt say, They be my servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. So he's sending these out in advance. These are gifts. He's going to, you know, Esau is intended to be stunned because here are these magnificent assets. And uh, uh, whose are they? Well, it's, it's for you. <laughs> it's a gift from, from our boss, you know. So uh, that should work. <laughs> and so commanded he the second and the third and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when ye find him. And say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us, for he said, "I will appease him with the." For he said, "I will appease them with, the, with the present that goes before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept of me." So Jacob has, you know, he, he does, even after all this, isn't sure what kind of reaction he's going to get. He's pretty uptight, with some justification, but of course God is with him and, and has manifested Himself to him and so forth. And he went, and he, uh, he, he and he went the present over the, before him, and he himself lodged that night in the company. And he rose up that, up that night, took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Yabok. I'll come back to the brook in a minute. He took them and sent them over the brook and sent over uh, that he had. And he was left alone. Now this is, this is okay, so this is all set up. The, 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 he's, got, he's put the, uh, uh, his wives and so forth in the order, in, in escalation order of the ones that he values the most. So, you know, Rachel and, and, and Joseph, and well, Benjamin isn't born yet, but uh, they are, are, the, are the last. He puts the, you know, he sort of remind, reminds me once we were on a, a, getting on a plane, and you know how they always do, they talk about the, you know, when, when, if there, there's a sudden change in cabin pressure, that your, your mask will drop off, for you, so forth. You've all heard that if you've been flying, right? And it says, you know, if you're with a small child, you should put on yours first, and then the child's. And there's one else says, if, you have, if you're traveling with two children, now's a good time to figure out which one you love the most. You know? <laughs> and, and of course, I couldn't believe my ears, you know. <laughs> she was, of course, just kidding, but they don't generally do, do much kidding. But anyway, that was sort of what Jacob did. He put the ones he loved the most last. In this, in, but he arranges all this, but then he's, he's set them all over the brook. He's there, alone. <clears throat> And the scripture doesn't tell us much about what happened, but that which it, it tells us is <coughs> very provocative. Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day, or till the ascending of the morning, is what it actually says in the Hebrew. And uh, now this, it says there was a man there. Now you and I could speculate all kinds of things, except let me tell you, let's look ahead, 
In the book of Hosea, it is called an angel by, the, by Hosea in the scripture, in the Holy Scripture. And also, Jacob, when you get down to verse 30, forthcoming, he calls this person God. So most scholars recognize you can't escape the fact that this is a, a, a person in, 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 that is God. And one of the glib ways to talk about it is a pre-incarnate um, ex experience of Jesus Christ. Um, okay, let's... And, and he, he goes to ask him what's his name, and he's going to get a very evasive kind of answer, and I'll come back to that. We'll, get, we'll take that when we get there. But, but he's wrestling with him, and this is not, a, you know, a brief little encounter. All night long, until morning when the one he's wrestling with begs for him to let go because he's, he's got other things to do, okay? So right away we're kind of puzzled. What on earth is going on here? And notice, and when he saw that he prevailed not against him, that is his adversary, is, uh, you know, isn't, isn't, uh, isn't, isn't losing, the adversary apparently resorts into a supernatural gesture. He touches the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. In other words, the one he's wrestling with him apparently has to resort to putting his leg, his, his, his hip out of joint, from which he will limp the rest of his life. This isn't something that's going to heal over the next few days, you know. And, uh, and then it goes on in, in verse 26, and he said, let me go. Who said let me go? Jacob, no, his adversary. Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. <laughs> this guy, Jacob, is, is, is a character. You know, we, 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 we recognize him as a, you know, kind of a pushy, conniving swindler. You know, he swindles his elder brother out of the birthright. He, uh, you know, his whole, and he, you know, uh, he defrauds. His older brother of the of the, you know, the patriarchal blessing by taking advantage of his father who's blind can't he pulls that whole stunt we saw. Jacob's a character. He guess he in a sense he meets his match in his uncle Laban and spends 20 years getting defrauded step by step by Laban. So that's probably poetic justice in a sense. But here's this this guy. Um, you know you, you get sort of a namby pamby view of him in the early chapters because you know Esau's the man of the field. And, you know, Jacob's the guy of the tents. He's sort of a you know, mama's boy or something. Hey, this guy. Now, here he encounters this person. I have no idea what he thought he was doing in the beginning of it, but certainly before it's over, he recognizes who he's got that he's wrestling with. And he's wrestling with him in which his adversary cripples him, says, let go, I've got, I, I've got business. You know, I've, if you, we both have other things to do. He could be saying, in effect, to Jacob, hey, buddy, you've got something, you've got, the morning's coming, you've got Esau to face. In other words, they both have reason to break it off, right? But his adversary says, let me go for the morning, a sense. I'll not let you go except you bless me. What on earth's going on here? Well, first of all, Jacob's the guy that stole the blessing from his elder brother, Right? So part of what he, in effect, may be asking for here is to legitimize the blessing that he stole. Because clearly, God had declared to the mother, among others, that he would be the blessed one. That's why she felt apparently justified in taking matters in her own hands. God doesn't need our help. We usually mess it up when we try to help him. But in any case, he was destined to have the blessing. So part of what Jacob may be doing here is to get that sanction, to get that, you know, Let's you know, sign on the dotted line kind of thing, okay? But in any case, his adversary says to him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Now, God, when God asks a question, he's not looking for new information. He's trying to call your attention to where you're at, okay? When, when, when God goes to the Garden of Eden, says, Adam, where art thou? He's not hunting for him. He knows where he is. He's asking you to take stock of what you're, where you are. Boy, we need to do that. We could, spend a, we could make a whole sermon on that. Where art thou? Where are we? When you meet a good Christian friend, hey, where are you? 
What's the Lord doing in your life? And we wince a little bit. Do we tell them the truth or shine on? You know. No, really. Um, what is thy name? He's asking him to remember who, and he says, my name is Heel Catcher. Okay? My, my name, I'm the supplanter, right? And uh, uh, from Genesis 25, you remember all that, okay? And uh, so, he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. You know, Jacob is not a namby-pamby uh, mother's boy. He apparently was a tough, within some kind of constraints here, obviously, but nevertheless, he uh, acquitted himself rather, what shall I say, aggressively. You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. This is where Jacob's name is changed. So that raises a whole, is, a whole question, is what does Israel mean? Okay? And most people would say that it, it means, uh, well, they have a number of different translations, but um, the name is either Prince or El, um, or a wrestler with God. It really means a wrestler with God. It can be strand, uh, translated, he that striveth with God, or he who perseveres with God. And uh, the word may be associated with a root sar, which means prince, which is a link implied here because it shall be called no more Jacob but Israel, for as a prince thou hast power with God. So both ideas are embodied in the uh, amplifying sentence which continues. But it may surprise you that the, the name Israel can be uh, defended as translated as a princely wrestler with God. It certainly affects here. Here's Jacob, who's clear, clearly a prince because he's one of the patriarchs. He's been sanctioned to be the line from which the Messiah will come. Um, he certainly has prevailed. He's wrestled with God. And they, even though that may puzzle us to try to visualize, that's clearly what the text says. Um, but it fascinates me to stand back and watch today. Because here's Israel still wrestling with God. They're still not really buying the Torah. They've got this whole Talmudic thing they do. You know, there's a whole issue. And in fact, when you read Hosea 5.15 and other passages, you need to understand what the tribulation is all about. We all know that there's a seven-year period that both the New Testament and Old Testament really nails down. It's the most documented period of time in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. And the last half of that, Jesus himself labels as the Great Tribulation. And the purpose of that is to drive Israel to the wall. And what will, the climax of that will be that Israel will acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. That's Hosea 5.15. And uh, Jesus himself, in Hosea, in the Old Testament, says, I will return to my place, that must have meant he left it, until they acknowledge their offense. In their affliction, they will seek me earnestly. See, anyone that thinks that the church goes through the tribulation has two pieces of homework to do. They need to understand what the church really is. Most people who are a little mixed up on eschatology, it's not a question of eschatology, it's a question, which is a study of the last time, it's a study of ecclesiology. To really understand the mystical, mystical nature of the church and how it's in juxtaposition or, or separate from, uh, from Israel. And uh, so... And the, the second problem, you need, you need to understand, you need to do a study of the tribulation, what it is, what its objectives are, how it's bounded, what starts it, what ends it, so forth. And so uh, the, the, you'll discover in your own study, don't take my word for it, that's breaking the rules. You know what, you, let me remind you, Acts 1711 goes to the top of your notepad. That's where Luke tells you, don't believe anything Chuck Mister tells you. But receive the word with all openness of mind and search the scriptures daily to prove whether those things be so. But in any case, here we, it's an interesting parallel that the name of Israel, which was gained at this wrestling here, will uh, prophetically perhaps, at least in a, in, a, in, a, in a broader strategic sense, reflect in advance the wrestling that this nation is going to endure um, uh, before, they, before the second coming. In fact, it's a prerequisite condition of the second coming. There's no prerequisite conditions for the rapture. It'll catch us all by surprise. But the second coming in power and glory will come in a very specific timetable that's been laid out. So, anyway, he says, Your name shall no, no, uh, no more be called Jacob, but Israel. I want to mention something else. I think I, I make the point of it a little later anyway, but so I don't miss it. I want you to notice something else. 
All through the Bible, there are occasions where people's names are changed. Abraham became Abraham. Sarai became Sarah, right? Uh, Saul of Tarsus became Paul, and so on. In each of those cases, um, once the name has been given, it never changes. Paul is never called Saul once he's Paul, right? Abraham, Abraham is never called Abraham once he's called Abraham. In other words, the name changes are uh, uh, done. There are two exceptions to that, and Jacob's one of them. You find his name all through the Bible after this verse. You also find him occasionally, not often, but occasionally called Israel. And we'll say, gee, they're interchangeable. Yes, they are, but you'll notice, I want you to notice as you read the scripture, when he's called Jacob, he's in the flesh. He's mostly in the flesh. When he's really shining, when he does it right, he's called Israel. And some people say, well, they're used interchangeably. Yes, they are, but they're... Look at the context very closely and see what you come to. Um, same thing with Simon Peter. He's called Peter. He's called Simon. Watch closely. Which one? Simon, Simon. Satan has decided to have you and sift you as wheat and so forth. You know, notice the, 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 the new name is a compliment. There's times he doesn't earn the compliment. You follow me? And there's other times. You know, what you can notice in the two names. Anyway, um, so... Jacob, in verse 29, asked him. He says, oh, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. He'd like to know who this guy is. And he, and he said, wherefore is it that thou dost ask, ask after my name? You notice he doesn't answer the question. And uh, this is the same thing that um, happens uh, in Judges 13. When Manoah is confronted by an angel to tell about Samson and so forth. What is thy name? And, he say, and what he really says is, my name is awesome. He uses the word there, wonderful. Well, we, we call that his name. Well, it could be his name or what's really a description why you're not really getting his name. Okay? He can't contain it that simply, you see. Um, so this issue of my name, I encourage you as you mature in your Bible studies is to be very sensitive to this business of being, what the name means. Not just an individual name, but the whole concept of having a name. And uh, I think you'll discover that when you get to the Ten Commandments as a mature um, student, you'll notice that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain has nothing to do with swearing. I'm not saying you should swear. Don't misunderstand. I think it has to do with ambassadorship. When you take his name, you're representing him to the world as his ambassador. And if you take that in vain, that's when you do that when you misrepresent him to the world. And that should give us pause. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of us can recall significant incidents where we have failed to properly represent God by our conduct, by our demeanor, by our presentations of whatever kind. Um, I think that's what that commandment's all about. It's not about you know, foul language. Not that, 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 that's, also, that's also disreputable, but I think that commandment goes far deeper than simply a lack of maturity or discipline in controlling the tongue. It's far deeper. Anyway, so Jacob's asking him, what's your name? And he says, why, why is it that you ask for my name? He, but he does comply with Jacob's request. Jacob would not let go. I don't know if it's a hammerlock or just a grip around his ankles. I have no idea. But he wouldn't let go until he got his blessing. And he got his blessing. So you notice the two things that he got here are the very two things that he had defrauded his brother of. Right? The birthright and the, uh, the blessing. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, which means uh, the face of God. For I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Wow. You see, and and there's a, there's, there is a sense in which we have not, no one has seen God in the sense of its completeness. But there are hundreds of people that have seen God in the resurrection. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, he challenges, and so forth. So uh, that, that, th th there's a whole debate you can get into on that. But basically here, uh, Jacob himself, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. He's, he's flabbergasted that he's actually been in contact with God. And I, I personally believe this is a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Jesus Christ. 
and call the name of the place Peniel, or Penuel, same thing, slight, there's a slight vowel difference. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. See, he's limping. He's going to be limping for the rest of his life. In chapter 49, when he, he, at the end of his days, he prophesies with 12 tribes, leaning on a staff. So he's going to carry this as, a, as an emblem of this encounter. And there's an analogy, of course, with Paul and his thorn in the flesh, which was his offset for some unusual insights he had. So, um, and therefore, now there, this also leads to an interesting observation by the Jewish community subsequently. He says, therefore, the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, that is, upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. Now, this is not in the Torah. It's not part of the normal Mosaic code, but it is a practice by observant Jews, Peniel. See, the, the, the wrestling occurred, notice, as Jacob was on the threshold of the land of promise. This is occurred as what essentially is the boundary as he goes from, from Haran to, to the promised land. This is where he was named Israel. And uh, it's called Penuel, which is given in response to Jacob's new name. So he gave this place a name in response to his name. But there's also this peculiar dietary restriction. And Orthodox Jews still refuse to eat the tendon of the hindquarter of animals because of, uh, in their deference to this unusual event that occurs here. In, uh... Now, there's something else. All through this, there are very colorful plays on words in the Hebrew. We miss that because we're dealing in a translation. And I won't spend too much time on this, but I'll show you just one. First of all, Jacob is actually Yaakov. Yaakov. He's the man. And the place was the brook Yabak, Yabak, and it means emptying, and, uh, and uh, that's the place, Yabak. See, Yaakov, Yabak, and the word wrestling is Yabak, so he wrestled. So he got the man, the place, and the match are in the Hebrew, almost what we call homonyms, words that are pronounced very similarly but mean something totally different. So Jacob, the name of the brook, the location of it, and the fact that he's wrestling all have a very, very similar sound. If I was pronouncing the Hebrew properly, which I'm not, you would have a hard time disti dis distinguishing between the three. Okay? So before Yaakov could cross the Yabak, the land of blessing, that he had to be Yabak, wrestling. So that's probably all of us. That's probably true of all of us. That's true of all of us. We have a very naive presentation of the gospel and being saved. Except Jesus Christ come down the sawdust trail and boy, that's it. Done. No, it's not that simple. That's a beginning, not an end. That's, the, that's not the climax, it's the beginning. Our problem is not life after death. Our problem is life after birth. When you're born again, then what? The fact that you're here in these studies says something's happening. You're growing. You're, you're, you're seeking His Word, Himself, relationship. That's a, conti that, that's not, it's a continual thing and uh, should be. Well, okay, that's chapter 32 with wrestling. Now we get to this rather dramatic connect where Jacob finally does encounter his uh, erstwhile brother. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau came, and with him 400 men, and he divided the children unto Leah and unto Rachel, notice the order, and unto the two handmaids. And he put the handmaids and their children foremost, <laughs> then Leah and her children after, and then Rachel and Joseph the hindermost. Okay, Benjamin was not born yet, so... And he passed over before them, and he bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. Now, when you see, he didn't bow seven, he would bow, go a little further, bow, in other words, he's haltingly approaching with great deference to his brother. And, uh, and Esau ran to meet him, and embraced him, and fell on his neck, and kissed him, and they wept. It's been 20 years. And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, and said, Who are these with thee? said, the children which God hath graciously given thy servant. Notice the different style. He has the birthright. He's technically the one that should be the senior, but he's setting that aside. I'm your servant, Esau. Then the handmaidens came near, they and their children, and they bowed themselves. And Leah also with her children came near and bowed themselves. And after came Joseph near and Rachel, and they bowed themselves. And he said, what meanest thou? By all this drove which I met, he says, these are to find grace in the sight of thy, my Lord. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. He doesn't want this gift. Now, you and I think that's gracious. We don't understand the tribal customs. 
it was essential that Jacob get Esau to accept this gift because that gift is, was regarded as a covenant of friendship and he couldn't accept that gift and hold any grudges. That's the way it worked. You know, there's a, there's a, 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 a cleanliness to that kind of thing. No, no messing around here. Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand, for therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou, hast, thou wast pleased with me. Take, I pray thee, my blessing that is brought to thee, because God hath dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. And he urged him, and, three, and here are uh, four key words, and he took it. When that happens, if you understand the dynamics, that's when you breathe a sigh of relief. Because up till now it could be a facade. Up till now it could still be some kind of back plot going on here. And he said, let us make our journey and let us go and I will go before thee. So Esau is not only accepting the gift, he's willing to travel along with him. Well, Jacob's smarter than that too. He wants them to take the gift, but he wants to go separate ways. Because he probably has enough instinct here to realize that this, this amicability may, have, may be perishable. And indeed it will be. He said, And my Lord knoweth that the children are tender, and the flocks and herds are young with me, uh, that are with me. And if men should overdrive them one day, all the flock will die. Let my Lord, I pray thee, pass over before his servant, and I will lead on softly according as the cattle that goeth before me and the children be able to endure, until I come unto my Lord, unto Seir. Now, apparently, um, Esau is on his way to Seir, which is east of the Jordan and south. And, and uh, Jacob is really going to go west, okay? So, Esau said, Let me now leave with thee some of the folk that are with me. Okay, if I don't go with you, let me leave you some, some of our, my brigands. <laughs> said, What needeth it? Let me find grace in the sight of the Lord. And Esau returned that day on his way unto Seir. And Jacob journeyed unto Sukkoth, and built him a house, and made booths for his cattle. And therefore the name of the place is called Sukkoth, which means booths. And so, um, and it's called here Sukkoth by anticipation. It's named Sukkoth because Jacob lived there for quite a while in these... In these uh, uh, he, he, and he apparently, I forget the exact numbers, I think he's there for maybe 20 years. This wasn't a little casual stopover. And it was probably a big mistake, because he's going to get nothing, because he's not following God's instructions. He was supposed to be heading down to Beersheba. But he stops off here, and, and uh, uh, it's on the east side of the river, and it's, uh, it's south of the brook Jabbok. The Yabbok brook is about halfway between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. On, and it's on the east side of the Jordan, to give you a rough feeling for this. And he's, he's, he, of course, is traveling uh, westward here. And Jacob came to Shalem, the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, when he came from Padan Aram and pitched his tent before the city. And he bought a parcel of field where he had spread his tent at the hand of the children of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of money. And... Uh, now, uh, pieces, uh, these are actually, the, the Hebrew there is lambs. Either they were equivalent to the price of a lamb, or some scholars suspect that they had a lamb emblemed, in, in, you know, as a, as a symbol on the coin. Uh, there's different scholastic speculations, what difference does it make? And he erected there an altar and called it El Elohe Israel, God the God of Israel. And uh, so he erected an altar. So, by the way, something, another point I want to make before, I, so I don't forget it. As you study the life of Jacob, the wrestling of the angel and the new name is probably the pinnacle of his career. From at this point on, he operates uh, in some respect. He he's not free of mistakes. He makes some very serious ones. But he's, uh, he's regarded by most scholars as that that's a whole new um, uh, aspect of his life. And uh, so let's move to Genesis 34. We have a rather sordid tale here that... Uh, occurs, uh, and it wouldn't have occurred if he hadn't stopped in that region near Shechem. Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Weren't supposed to do that, by the way. They're supposed to stay separate, but she mixes with the Canaanite gals. And when Shechem, 
who is the, name, is the son of Hamor the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. And the, the word in the Hebrew, the lachach, is took forcibly. It, it, it implies that an irresistible force was used. And uh, the word ana, defiled, is uh, 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 it's clear that uh, this is what you and I would call rape. And uh, so this, after a, in this culture, when a woman was debased in this sort of way, it was a, it left her with no expectancy of having any kind of uh, valid marriage. This was, in that culture, fatal for her. But in, in, uh, even though he raped her, he says his, his soul clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And uh, so to her heart, he really, uh, by the way, something you won't probably find in your study Bible, but the word Hamor, his father's name is Ass. It's the, it's the, it's the Canaanite word for Ass. And, uh, it's a, now this is a very striking proof of different ideas. You and I would regard that as a derogatory label. In that culture, it was not, because that was a prized asset, if you will. No pun intended. It, it was a, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that what was associated with that animal was, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was sprightly, well-proportioned, and, uh, and, and speaks of great activity. So uh, it, it's not a derogatory label as we might infer. And, uh, and so the chief, uh, anyway, so anyway, Shechem spake unto his father Hamor and said, Give me this damsel to wife. And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it. And the men were grieved. And they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel in lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. Now there's no argument so far. I think all of us would agree that this was inappropriate on his behalf. It is a tragedy, but that it's, it's a pebble that causes a landslide, as we'll see, certainly. There, he wrought folly in Israel. This is the first place in the Bible where that term occurs as a, a label of the nation. And uh, it's doing it anticipatorily, in a sense, because the nation isn't really born until Exodus. But it's an interesting phrase here, following in Israel, in line with Jacob's daughter. And Hamar communed with him, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter. I pray you give her him to wife. And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell, and trade ye therein, and get you possessions therein. Sounds like a good proposal, doesn't it? What they he may not have realized is there was a strategy behind this, as you'll see, to get to take over their land. That is, the, Israel's land. But anyway, Shechem said, Shechem said unto her, to her father and to her brethren, uh, let me find grace in your eyes, and what ye shall say unto me, I will give. Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. He's, he's giving him a blank check. Say what you will for dowry, I want her to wife. Now the sons of Jacob, and there's going to be specifically two sons of Jacob. Sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamer his father deceitfully, and said, Because he hath defiled Dinah their sister, and they said unto them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. But in this, we will, this will we consent unto you, if ye will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. Now they could try to sell this idea, because that was presumably the covenant relationship in which circumcision was ordained. But in any case... But if ye will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter, and we will be gone. And the words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. And the young man deferred not to do the thing, because he had delight in Jacob's daughter, and he was, and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came unto this gate of the city, and communed with the men of their city, saying, Now notice, what, notice the inside word here. These men are peaceable with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade therein, for the land, behold, is large enough for them. 
Let us take their daughters to us for wives, and let us give them our daughters. Only herein will the men consent unto us, for to dwell with us, to be one people, if every male among us be circumcised as they be circumcised. So the two are presenting this to the, to the rest of the guys. But notice the footnote here in verse 23. Shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. See, there's an agenda here. They think they can take these guys over. That's their, that's their strategy. And unto Hamer and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of his city. Every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of his city. Now, something that's quite operative here, but let me just be quite explicit so you don't miss the point. When you circumcise an infant, that's a trivial thing as far as that infant is concerned. It heals quickly and that's what it is. When you have a grown man circumcised, he is in some substantial discomfort for a while. That doesn't, that's not, you know, that's not, a, that's not a casual thing. And that's exactly the point. It came to pass that on the third day, when they were sore, the two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, down his brethren, took each man his sword, came upon the city boldly, and slew all the males. Wow. The entire city. These two guys. Simeon and Levi. Why would it be those two of the eleven? There are eleven sons, right? Because Benjamin hadn't been born yet. Right? There's eleven. Where are the other nine? Why Simeon and Levi? Because Dinah was their sister. They were all born of Leah herself, not, her, not the concubines or Rachel. So you need to understand that those first four guys were seniors. And Simeon and Levi, apparently, felt particularly outraged and took it upon themselves to conduct this outrage. And they slew Hamer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword. And they took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. And the sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. And they took their sheep and their oxen and their asses and that which was in the city and that which was in the field and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives took they captive and spoiled even all that was in the house. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, Ye have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. You know, before going on, this is sort of disturbing. Jacob's upset, but he's upset about his own vulnerability. Not with the outrage that they, he doesn't rebuke them for the sin they've committed. They've committed murder on a wholesale basis. And because of all of this, we'll discover that uh, they will be passed over in the blessing of the birthright. In a subsequent passage, we'll talk about the succession. And there's some other issues going to come up too, but they're, they're, going, to get, they're going to be deferred as, as, as um, uh, 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 far as the birthright is concerned. You know, it's interesting to me that Levi's among them because you'll discover that Levi is a, uh, apparently a pretty aggressive. You know, you think of the priests, they sort of, you think of them as sort of passive. Not at all. Under Moses, it was the Levites that stood with him, and that's why they were blessed by being the, you know, being the, uh, the priesthood, if you will. Um, uh, the, Le the Levites were, uh, these were uh, what you and I would call politically hawks. They were aggressive. And, uh, but in any case... Um, they sure overdid it here. So it's interesting that Jacob doesn't scold him for the sin. He scolds him for the vulnerability they brought upon the, on the entire group. And they said, should we deal with our sister as with a harlot? And uh, so it is interesting, as a footnote in your studies, to put Deuteronomy 20, verse 16 through 18. It doesn't justify what they did here, but you will discover that in Deuteronomy, in the Torah, 
This is yet to come later, of course, under Moses. God says, But of the cities of these people which the Lord thy God doth give thee for an inheritance, thou shalt save alive nothing that breathes, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. And one of the things you need to study and be sensitive to, why on earth does the Torah in Deuteronomy and subsequently instruct Joshua and his following to wipe out every man, woman, and child of certain tribes? You need to understand what the Rephaim really were. But in any case, that's a footnote. Let's go on to chapter 35. Jacob, after some sojourn there, finally returns to where he was supposed to go, that is to Bethel. And God said unto Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. And then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, Put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. You know, it's interesting, worshiping God isn't enough. He wants no rivals. They apparently were worshiping God on the one hand, and yet they still had among themselves these teraphim, these, uh, and, and also apparently in their garments. And Jacob wakes up to the reality and tells them to put away the strange gods, whatever they might be, who knows what they were. Horoscope columns out of the newspaper, I have no idea, anyway, that are among you. And be clean and change your garments. We might take that to heart. There are things that um, have no place in our lives, in our homes. We might take that to heart. And Jacob said, let us arise and go up to Bethel, which means, by the way, Beth means house, El, God, the house of God up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar to, unto God, who answereth me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their, in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. It's interesting how they seem to bury these things under these huge terebinth trees. Um, Now, I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong with earrings. I, do, I infer from this that the earrings that they had may have borne symbols that were inappropriate. And uh, uh, it's interesting. There are many people that, will, when they visit Egypt or Athens, pick up pieces of jewelry and so forth, commemorating various uh, historical events, not realizing those historical events were, were um, pagan and demonic in many cases. And so an average person that's not a Christian, welcome to do those things. They're just art pieces after all. But for someone that takes God seriously, they're inappropriate. Um, as a student of architecture and history, I can remember looking forward to wanting to see the Oracle of Delphi, because all through ancient history you find the Oracle of Delphi. And I just, uh, just out of curiosity, when we were up in Athens, I wanted to go up there and just see this place, because there's a place... That, and as I went up this long road and saw the various things and, and I saw these, some of the monuments with crosses upside down with serpents on them and I began to, I began to it somehow dramatized to me that this isn't just some interesting colorful artifact of the past. This is a place that they sacrificed to demons. And as it all sank in, I actually became physically ill. I actually uh, became very ill. As I, as I really realized, as you get confronted with the paganism that surrounds us. And, uh, you know, we're in election year, it happens right now, and you watch the rhetoric. And I mean on both sides of the aisle. I'm not, uh, but it's interesting how there's this organized attack on our culture, on the institution of marriage, on the validity of the Ten Commandments. Not just breaking the commandments, but the very fact that they should have any place at all even culturally in our history. Just, it's, it's astonishing. And, and you go right through this, almost everything God has ordained in the book of Genesis is under aggressive, vicious attack with a hatred on the part of some that's actually shocking. But let's get on here. Okay, so, they, so Jacob has a revival going of, of sorts here where they get rid of this stuff. And they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. You know, Jacob was sweating that all these people would uh, dislike them, and they probably did, but at the same time, they also didn't mess around. They gave them a wide berth, apparently. So Jacob came to Luz, which is the old name, 
which was in the land of Canaan, which is Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. That was the old name, and he gave him a new name. And he built there an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God appeared unto him when he fled from the face of his brother. El Bethel. Uh, that is the God of the house of God. See, But Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried beneath Bethel under an oak. And the name of it was called Alon Bakluth, and, and, uh, which means the oak of weeping. And uh, it's interesting that uh, uh, Jacob's wives' idols were also buried under oak back in Shechem, back a few verses ago. And uh, so, so at Bethel, God is going to confirm the promise that he had made there earlier, back in, ch in chapter 32. And, uh, and so Jacob's name change is the evidence of that blessing. So let's go through here in verse uh, 9. God appeared unto Jacob again when he came out of Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said unto him, Thy name is Jacob, thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. The term is El Shaddai in the Hebrew. The all-sufficient one. Um, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee. And kings shall come out of thy loins. You know, that's an interesting, don't dismiss that. You see, there's been no kings yet. We're not into Samuel. You with me? You always have this impression that, you know, God didn't want them to have kings, but they kept screaming if they want a king like everybody else, so God relented and gave them a king. That's a very superficial understanding, because the kings were prophesied here in as early as Genesis 35. Also, the lineage and identity of David was pro predicted in the times of the judges. That's before the time of Samuel. And we'll, get, we'll talk about that as we go further in. But just recognize that many of the little summaries that we get that I'll call uh, you know, the, 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 in the Sunday school level of, of teaching uh, are, are not quite on, on, on mark here. Kings shall come out of thy loins, indeed. Not only kings, but the king of kings. Incidentally, and the land which I gave Abraham and Isaac to thee, I will give it. See, it's being, thee is reconfirming the covenant to Jacob here, which I gave to Abraham and Isaac. To thee will I give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And this is verse 12 here is being challenged by the world today, by the European Union, by the United Nations, and by many that are elbow length away from our president. And God went up from him in the place where he talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. And he poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. And Jacob called the name of the place where God spake with him, Bethel, house of God. And they journeyed from Bethel, and there was but a little way to come to Ephrath, or Ephrathah, if you will. And Ephrathah is the old name for the place that will be called the house of bread, Bethlehem, Bethlehem Ephrathah. And Rachel travailed, and she had hard labor. Here's Rachel. She'd, had, she'd given her firstborn son was Joseph. We'll talk a lot about Joseph in the coming sessions. But here she's travailing, and she's in very hard labor. And it came to pass, when she was in hard labor, that the midwife said unto her, Fear not, thou shalt have this son also. It came to pass, as her soul was in departing, for she died, that you call his name Ben Onani, which, uh, which, but his father called him Benjamin. Uh, the one is the son of my sorrow, or birth pains, if you will. But, uh, but uh, the father, Jacob, calls him Benjamin, the son of my right hand. And boy, is that a prophetic statement in some interesting ways. And Rachel died and was buried in the way to Ephrathah, which is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar upon her grave that is the pillar of Rachel's grave unto this day. And when you go, to, when you, between, you go south of Jerusalem towards Bethlehem, there is a place there they call Rachel's tomb. It's a traditional site. Some scholars feel it's only a tradition. Uh, but in any case, it's highly venerated, of course, in the Jewish community in any case. But uh, whether it's actually her grave or not, is a, who knows. But uh, anyway, that's, that's a... a, a, a an issue. 
Now this is the first son that is born in the land. The other 11 of the 12 were born in, in Syria, but on Aram. And uh, so Bethel is about 10 miles north of Jerusalem, and uh, Bethlehem is about 6 miles south of Jerusalem, just to give you a rough feeling of the geography here. And uh, so um, but a lot of people dying. Deborah died, Rachel died, more coming. Israel joined and spread his tent beyond the Tower of Edar. It came to pass when Israel dwelt in that land that Reuben, uh-oh, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And Israel heard it. And uh, this is, this is, there are some, see, uh, uh, Reuben was the eldest. He, in theory, would have been the, the one, the, the, the uh, eldest son of, of uh, Israel and the, uh, the, had the birthright. And some feel that he may have been trying to replace his father's patriarch by this traditional act. This was a very uh, a common pagan procedure for the young buck to assert himself by taking his father's concubine, uh, not just for the lust involved, but for the act. It's a way of rebelling and, 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 and taking, taking over, in a sense, asserting yourself as the, uh, uh, as the patriarch of the family. And, uh, but in this case, he, by this, he loses his birthright. We'll deal with that in chapter 49. But this causes Reuben to forfeit his lineage as the, the senior of the, of the gang here. And uh, now the sons of Jacob are 12 at this point, because we've got Benjamin with us. We've got sons of Leah were Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, and Simeon and Levi, and Judah and Issachar and Zebulun, sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and the sons of Bilhi, Bilha, which, are, which was uh, Rachel's handmaid, Dan and Naphtali, or Naphtali or however, and uh, the sons of Zilpah, where Leah's handmaid was Gad and Asher, and these are the sons of Jacob, which were born unto him in Pat and Aram. They're all born, with the exception of, 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 of uh, Benjamin, all born in Syria. Just to refresh your memory of the slide before, we had Abraham, who had under Sarah, uh, Sarah under Hagar, had of course Ishmael, but under Sarah had Isaac, and then uh, uh, who in turn with Rebekah had Esau, the firstborn, but then Jacob, and under, two, under Leah and Rachel, his, his wives, Leah gave birth to Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah in that order, and, um, and ultimately Dinah, and that's why Simeon and Levi were direct, they were his, the, the, the full, the full brother and sister with Dinah. And then, of course, uh, Rachel, because she's barren, re resorts to this procedure with her handmaid, Bilhah, and has Dan and uh, Naphtali. Leah sees that working out pretty well, so she does the same thing. Has her handmaid uh, with uh, Jacob give, give birth to Gad and Asher, by now, though, God has favor on Rachel, and she has Joseph. And uh, meanwhile, Leah brings, brings forth two more, Issachar and Zebulun. And, now, uh, and he, Rachel now has Benjamin, but dies in childbirth. We're going to see in the subsequent sessions that uh, Joseph will have two children when he's in Egypt. But when the family moves down there, Jacob, who's still alive then, will adopt his two sons as his own. Many people miss the significance of that. So they're not really his grandchildren. They are really uh, tri they're directly adopted by Jacob. So you actually have 13 tribes, if you count Joseph as really two. So you've got 13 to choose from. That's why you can see them numbered 20 different times in the Bible, each time in a different order, each time, many times, a different one omitted, but always ending up with 12. And that may puzzle you until you realize you've got 13 to choose from. If you want... You want to include them all, then you have the tribe of Joseph. If you want to drop one out for some reason, like the Levites, because they don't go to war or whatever, you can take that out and still then split the tribe of Joseph into two, Manasseh and Ephraim, and you still have 12, not counting the one you've dropped out. Do you follow me? That'll puzzle you if you're trying to sort that out on yourself until you realize that it's a baker's dozen, okay? All right, so that's the 12 tribes. Okay, continuing then, chapter 35, and Jacob came to Esau, his, uh, Isaac, excuse me, Isaac, his father, unto uh, Mamre, the, the city of Arba, which is in Hebron, where Abram and Isaac sojourned. And the days of Isaac were 104 score, 180 years. And uh, Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons Esau and Jacob buried them, buried him. We have one chapter, but it's very light. It's a lot of words that I will mispronounce, but it's basically before we get into Joseph, the Bible takes, sets aside Esau. Esau and the Edomites are going to be the traditional enemies of Israel. And so we're going to encounter them. Herod was not Jewish. He was an Edomite that appointed by Rome. 
So you need to understand that Esau and his descendants are, are adversaries. But these are the generations of Esau who is Edom. Those are synonyms. Edom means red, but you understand Esau is red in two different ways. Uh, Esau took his wives from the daughters of Canaan, Ada the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Ahalabah uh, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and uh, Bashamath, is is Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. Now what's confusing about this, these, two of these names are not among those that were listed earlier in chapter 26 and chapter 28. So either there, it's often in those days a woman might have two different names, especially if they're living in different regions or something. Um, or there may have been more wives that we know of, so it's confusing. Scholars have different views. I could take you through all that, but it doesn't really matter. From these three wives, he has five sons and a lot of grandsons. And, uh, uh, but just recognize that there is some scholastic differences to which wife is which, and I won't get into all that here. We need to wrap this up. Ada bear under Esau Eliphaz, and Beshemeth uh, bear Ruel, and uh, Ahalabama bear Jewish and Jeolam and Korah, and these are the sons of Esau which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. Korah doesn't show up in some of the later lists, so we suspect that he may have died right after receiving a, a chieftainship, but that's speculation. Anyway, Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle, all his beasts and all of his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. One strange contrast between these two groups. Jacob has all his sons, in, except for one, the last one, in uh, Syria, and brings them into the land. Esau has all his sons in the land of Canaan, takes them to Seir. Not a big deal, but it's, it's almost antiphonal in a sense. And their riches were more than they might dwell together. Just remember, just like Lot and Abraham was. In the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in Mount Seir. The names of Esau's sons, Eliphaz, the son of Ada, wife of uh, Esau, Ruel, the son of Bashamut, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, Gatam, and Kenaz. And Timna was the concubine of Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare uh, Eliphaz Amalek. Now here's a name you're going to see a lot of, the Amalekites. They also, of course, will be a very prominent adversary of Israel. But they're, in effect, from, from the Edomites. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. The sons of Ruel were Nahath, Zerah, Shammah, Mitzah. These were the sons of Bashamath, Esau's wife, and these were the sons of Ahelabah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife, and she bare unto Esau, Jeush, Jalem, and Korah. And these were dukes, or chiefs, if you will, of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, Eliphaz the firstborn of Esau, the a duke, or chief, if you will, of T uh, Teman, Duke Omar, or uh, Zepho, and Kenaz. And Duke Korah, Duke Gatam, and Duke uh, Am Amalek. And these are the dukes that came out of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. These are the sons of Ruel, Esau's son, Duke of Nahath, Duke of Zerah, Duke of Shammah, Duke of Mizah. And these are the dukes that came of Ruel in the land of Edom. And these are the sons of Beshemoth, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Ahalabah, the Esau's wife, Duke Jeush. They all get chieftains here, in other words. Uh, Duke Jalem, Duke Korah. These are the dukes that came out of Ahalabah the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife, and these are the sons of Esau, who was Edom, and they are their dukes or chiefs. And these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan and Shobal and Zibion and Anna and the Dishon and Ezer and Dishon, and these are the dukes or chiefs of the Horites, the children of Seir, in the land of Edom. And the children of Lotan were Hori and Haman, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. And the children of Shobal were these, Alvan and Manahath and Ebal and Shepho and Onan, Onan, Onam, and these were the children of Zibion, both Aja and Anna, and that was that. And this was that. That was this? Anyway. And, uh, oh, excuse me. This was that Anna that found the mules in the wilderness as, she, as he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. And the children of Anna were these, Dishon, Ahalabah, the daughter of Anna. And these are the children of Dishon, Hemdan, Eshban, Ithran, Jaran. The children of Ezer were these, Bil Bilan, uh, Zavan, and Canaan. And the children of Dishon were these, Uz and Aran. These are the dukes that came out of the Horites, and, and uh, Duke Lotan, Duke Shobal, Duke Zibion, Duke Anna, Duke Deshan, Duke Ezer, Duke Dishan. These are the dukes that came out of Hori among the dukes of the land of uh, Seir, and these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. And Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Dinhaba. And Bela died, and Jobab, the son of Zerah of Basra, reigned in his stead. 
Jobab died, and Hushan of the land of Tam uh, Tamani reigned in his stead. And Hushan died, and Hadad the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Avith. And Hadad drived, <coughs> died, and uh, Samla of Masraka reigned in his stead. And Samla died, and the Saul of Reboth by the river reigned in his stead. And Saul died, and Baal Hanan the son of Akbor reigned in his stead. And ba uh, Baal Hanan the son of Akbor died, and Hadar reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Pau, and his wife's name was Mahatabal, and the daughter, uh, that is the daughter of Metred, the daughter of Mezahab. And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau according to their families, after their places, by their names, Duke Timna, Duke Alva, Duke Heth, and it goes through this whole list again, according to the inhabitations in the land of their possession, he is Esau, the father of the Edomites. Now this doesn't mean much to you and I, and I obviously have just skimmed through these things, mispronouncing most of them, um, but uh, uh, Unless I've missed something, none of these popped in my mind as being that essential for what comes follow, other than they are, it is the record, and these are, these are names and people and tribes that are going to be very, very important to Israel because they're the adversaries. We're going to counter the Edomites collectively as adversaries uh, frequently throughout the scripture. So we are going now to shift gears next time. We've finished with, we've, we, we had two sessions on Abraham, two on Isaac, two on Jacob. We're now going to shift to three sessions on Joseph. And we're, it's, it is going to be a very, very colorful, different uh, uh, drama forthcoming. One of the most dramatic uh, chronicles that you'll find anywhere in literature, let alone in the Bible. It's just uh, uh, going to be a lot of fun. We're going to talk about Joseph and these weird dreams that he has. And I'm gonna, these dreams will surprise you. They not only change the course of history, they also unlock critical chapters in the book of Revelation. So we'll touch on that. There's going to be this very bizarre episode with Judah and his daughter-in-law, Tamar. That also will figure prominently in the messianic prophecies of Jesus Christ that emerge of all crazy places in the book of Ruth. We'll talk about that. And we'll also find, by the way, there are encryptions hidden behind the text that I'll highlight for you in a very surprising way. And then, of course, Joseph is imprisoned. He's falsely accused. and He's put in prison. And we're all familiar with that. And there's a very interesting episode that occurs in prison that takes, has great impact 12 years later. And then, of course, uh, but uh, he, when imprisoned, he is going to be forgotten, and that's a whole issue there. So um, next time, I encourage you to read the uh, next four chapters in the book of Genesis. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you've brought us together to study that word. And we thank you too, Father, that you have given us a new name. That we too have a name that we are to manifest to the world. We thank you, Father, that you, before we have chosen you, you have chosen us. And so, Father, we would pray that you would reignite in each of us a new hunger, a new appetite for your word, that you would fill us with your spirit, that we each might be more effective, more faithful in declaring your name throughout all that we come in contact with. We do pray, Father, that you would help us through your energies and your equipment and your protection and your spirit that we would not take your name in vain. We thank you for the lessons in this series, which are many. We do pray, Father, that you'd help us to understand not only the people, but the implications for the nation and above all the implications for ourselves as we continue in your word, pleading the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.